This morning we're moving into a brand new series called Holy Devoted. Uh, it is a series taken from a letter that the Apostle Paul, this great missionary to the church, this great father of the church, is getting older in his own right. He also is showing the battle scars of years of preaching and teaching and being beaten and going through crazy things as one of the leaders and foundational members of the church. He begins to bring along these young men, these young protégés that he's teaching and bringing up in the Lord. And one of those young men is Timothy. And Paul, in this letter that we're going to read through today, is, is admonishing Timothy. He's encouraging Timothy to live his life in such a way that all of it reveals, all of it expresses the, the uh, preeminence of Jesus in his heart, that, that Jesus is living there and Paul is asking him to live his life in the same way. If you have your Bible here this morning, and I hope you always do, if you don't, we'll get you one. Let me know if you don't have a Bible. We'll hook you up before you leave today. Uh, if you've got your Bible app, then go ahead and open that up to 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4, uh, 12 through 16. I want to read this to you. This is the simple five verses that this whole series is drawn from. It's just a treasure trove of of, uh, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Follow along with me. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through the prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give, give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Today we're going to focus in on just one of these verses, verse 12. In these few simple words, Paul expresses to this young man, this young protege, Timothy, just what it means to live as an example. The words you're going to find are very simple, but carrying them out and living them out, I have found to be incredibly challenging, difficult in my own life. Again, 1 Timothy 4.12 says, don't let anyone look down upon you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith and in purity. Friends, can I tell you, it's terrifying and amazing to watch as my children have grown up to copy my lifestyle and my habits. That has been such a double-edged sword in my life because while well, my, my little boy, Austin, I could still remember doing little carpentry projects outside the house, and he would make some kind of little tool belt out of some rag, and he'd tuck little toys and, and uh, spatulas from the kitchen because he wanted to have a drill and a hammer just like his dad. And I could see him acting just like I did as I built things and as I made mistakes and as things didn't go my way. I've seen my little girl in the kitchen with, all dressed up in her tiny little apron and her little plastic toys and her little plastic bowls emulating her mom as she worked. And I've, I've seen my kids watch my example and copy it, both for good and for bad. You see, what I'm realizing is that I am a living, walking example I am a living, walking, and talking example. Now, as we look at this verse, I think it's fair to say that if you are living with excellence in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity, there's not going to be a whole lot left for sin. That if you're really living in this all-encompassing way as Paul is teaching this young man to live, then there's not a whole lot of cracks for the enemy to get in. In fact, I believe this reflects on a verse that Jesus himself would teach to his disciples on how they should love God. Maybe you will recognize this. Maybe it's the first time you've heard it. Jesus in Mark 12, 30 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your 
Now, the great author and pastor Andy Stanley would explain that the little word all, A-L-L, when it's translated from the original Greek text means all. Jesus is encouraging us, Paul is encouraging us to set an example with all we have, with all of our faculties, not just pieces, not just compartmentalized parts of our life on a Sunday morning. So how do we do this? How do we set an example wholly given over to Christ? How do we live in such a way that all of our faculties, all the parts of our body are firing in time and working with the Holy Spirit leading? There's a couple realities that I'd like to share before I answer that question. Because if these realities are true in your life, then it will directly affect your ability to carry out what Paul is asking us to do. You see, the first reality is simply this. You are shaped by the contents of your heart. You are being shaped by the things that you pour in, that you put in, that you hide, that you tuck away in your heart. The great King Solomon, by God given, the wisest man that ever lived, penned these simple words in Proverbs 4. He says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. The condition and focus of your heart determines the course of your life. And because of that, the second reality is so true. If you are shaped by the contents of your heart and if you're going to live a life worthy of this high calling that Jesus himself has asked us to live, then you must start with one essential ingredient. This is a one ingredient cake. This is the one thing that you must have if any of this is going to be possible. You must make Jesus Lord of your life. If you're going to achieve anything, if any of the sermons you ever heard have just been an exercise in frustration, then it's possible that you have personally never made Jesus Lord of your life. It's not about church attendance. It's not about some time that you prayed. It's not about the fact that, you, that you've learned to, to sing worship songs on the, local, on the local praise station. It is about you at some point in your life having stepped across the line in the sand and said, Jesus I want you to be Lord of my life. You will have personally to have made a decision, not that you were sprinkled with as a child, not that your parents were Christians, but that you yourself have decided at some point in your life that you remember, Jesus, you're in charge. I want to be a baptized believer in Jesus Christ and you followed through with it. If you have made that decision, if you have made that step, then so many of these sermons, including the one today, is now within reach. But if you have missed that one thing, then this will be an exercise in frustration for the rest of your life. Reality three is simply this, that once Jesus fills your heart, once he is there, then you will begin to reflect his spirit living in your heart. You see, he obeys us to live out his commands. And as we do, we actually begin, something magical happens. You actually begin to starve part of your soul, part of your heart. It's the part that the Bible says is filled with sin. It is the part that the Bible says is filled with depravity. And as we live for Christ and we emulate him, then that piece of us begins to slowly dissipate and its strength over our life begins to weaken. And the power of Jesus begins to take control. And the example that you begin to set is one in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, and in your purity. I love this in Ephesians 3.16. Jesus writes, I pray that from his, Jesus' glorious unlimited resources, that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. You see, as Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, he writes these simple words about our heart. It says that the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. 
These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Friends, I believe that if you will make that commitment and if you will begin on a daily basis to feed the Spirit inside of you and to starve your sinful nature, that once Jesus is firmly established there, that we can begin striving and living from His power, that we can expect to set an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Paul would encourage another young protege. He's got all these young people coming around him that he's teaching him how to live. And he says to Titus, another young man, he says, and you yourself must be an example. By doing good works of every kind, let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Friends, setting an example is the purest and simplest form of leadership. Most of us are leading someone. Someone is being affected by your example. Someone is being influenced by how you live. Whether you are young or old, married or single, male or female, whether you are introverted or extroverted, someone is watching your life. There's a woman here at Bridge that is just the sweetest lady. She serves in such a mighty way. She is sweet and shy, quiet and unassuming. Her name is Cindy, Cindy Higginbotham. She is committed to the church and graces these halls on a weekly basis, serving behind the scenes, behind the radar. If you have visited Bridge in the last three or four years, you have been blessed by Cindy. You see, every person that visits Bridge and lets us know that you're here has received a handwritten welcome and encouragement and thanks for attending from Cindy. She has the most beautiful penmanship I've ever seen. It is a, a work of art to just receive a card from her. It's the most beautiful thing. In fact, last year alone, 370 families visited Bridge for the first time. Every single one of them received a handwritten, thoughtful card from Cindy. This missionary, this quiet, sweet, unassuming missionary is affecting lives. This year alone, 400 families have visited Bridge. Cindy has seen to it that either by her own hand or, or someone on her team has handwritten a welcome to every single one of them. You see, I have personally talked to people that have been affected and touched by her ministry, that, have, that are still here today because of that welcome that they received. Talk about influence. Many of you may not even know who Cindy is, but she is leading by example at Bridge. Recently, because of the growth of her ministry, she has added people to her team, and now other women are joining her example and serving and loving on new people that come to Bridge. Cindy is leading by example. Let me just say this again. Every person in this room is setting an example. And maybe the question we need to ask is not, am I setting an example? But the real question that I need to ask is, what example am I setting? What example of speech and conduct and love and faith and purity am I communicating? You see, if I have identified in my own life different ways that I have led, that I've set an example over the years, I can identify these things in seasons of my life, different ways that I've led. I'd, I'd love to share those with you this morning. Maybe you'll find yourself somewhere in this list. You see, the first way that I've led is there have been seasons where I've led out of complete ignorance. I've led out of ignorance. I, I, there's been times when I thought I had no influence, that nobody cared, that nobody was listening, that no one was paying attention, but I was dead wrong. You see, we affect people, how you work, how you parent, how you drive, how you shop, how you speak how you treat the, the waitress at the restaurant. All of us have influence. 
In fact, the greatest thing I may be able to leave you with today is for you to finally understand that you are making a difference. But what difference are you making? What is the example that you're setting as you live and as you work? But I've not only led out of ignorance, there's been seasons in my life where I lived out of sinfulness. I led out of sinfulness. There were seasons in my past that I realized I had influence and I used it to lead people away from God. These are actually some of the most painful memories of my life. They're the residuals of a life led with influence and led people away from the one thing that they needed. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul warns the church about people like this. And as he's writing the letter to the Romans, he writes, there are people that refuse to understand. They break their promises. They're heartless. They have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they teach others to do them too. Do you know that in the Bible there's actually a list of things that God hates? Did you know that in Proverbs 6, there's a list of seven things that God hates? And within that list, in Proverbs 6, 18, it says that God hates a heart that plots evil, that plans evil. Not only that, he hates feet that race to do wrong. Friends, I'll just be honest, for part of my life, that's how I lived. That was the influence that I exerted on the people around me. What I didn't realize then that I do now, is all I was doing was simply dancing to the tune of the enemy, of the devil himself. I was influencing on his behalf. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing to the Ephesian church, pens these words. He says, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Friend, if you are waking up in the morning and you plan to sin, you plan to draw your friends, the people that you influence into your lifestyle, I want you to know this morning that you are living in complete opposition to God of the universe. And he wants to draw you out of that lifestyle. I've not only led in ignorance, I've not only led in sin, but there are seasons of my life, friends, there's still seasons of my life where I just lead in hypocrisy. I just lead as a hypocrite. You see, sometimes I try to set an example, but my life does not match my message. My people that live with me see this the most. The people that live in my own house probably recognize this quicker than any other. You see, I have these times in my, in my week, in my month, where I just kind of get grumbly. I just kind of get cranky, and I get self-centered and self-focused, and I let everybody in my house know it, whether I say it out loud or not. They just know it. You got somebody like that in your house? Don't look at them. <laughs> Listen. I have these seasons, but you know what is so hypocritical? Is if one of you all were to call me on the phone in the midst of that, hey, how you doing? No, it's no trouble at all. I'd love to talk. I've got all the time in the world. My family's looking at me like, what? who is this man? <laughs> what is, you're, you were just being a jerk. <laughs> and, listen, is there anything that is more harmful, more hurtful than that kind of duplicity. That kind of double standard can be so harmful in our lives. But can I be honest? It can go much deeper than just flipping the switch when a neighbor shows up unannounced. Some of us are going to bed and waking up with unaddressed and growing sin in our life intentional sin growing in our life, and yet we walk around with this facade of spirituality, this mask of spirituality that everyone is convinced that everything's fine, and you are walking in intentional sin in your life. Jesus had some of his harshest words for people like me when I live like that. Listen as he speaks in Matthew 23, hypocrites, 
For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Friends, God wants to rescue you from that. There is no peace. There is no fulfillment. There is no purpose when you live in that place. I've lived and I have led. I've been an example in all those ways, but I pray that in this later season of my life, as I grow and mature in Christ, that I am now leading from the Holy Spirit. I pray that if there's anything good that is coming out of my life, my parenting, my ministry, my friendships, that the more I center my life on the Holy Spirit, on God, that somehow that is what is making a difference. I pray that that is the case for you. Because one of the greatest honors, one of the greatest things you'll ever experience in your life is when you have the opportunity to sit alongside, to walk alongside some person, and you get to be the visible evidence of Jesus in their life. And when that person finally breaks, when their heart finally opens to Jesus Christ, and you realize that God has used you to change a life for eternity, then you know that you are living and walking by the influence of the Holy Spirit. When you get to stand in these waters behind this screen and you get to plunge some young man, some old man, some young woman, some mother, some father into those waters because of what Jesus has done through you, that is one of the greatest things you'll ever experience. Ephesians 5, Paul writes this to all of us. He says, imitate God. Therefore, in everything you do, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Friends, you and I are created to be vessels and examples of God's love, his truth, and his message of salvation. When we accept this commission and we live like the one that gave us to it, gave that commission to us, then true purpose and fulfillment is finally possible. Jesus, the Son of God, has led us by his example. I want to read as we close this sweet reality of how he lived his life. He walked on earth as you and I walked. He lived as we lived. He felt what we felt. And this is how he chose to live his life. Philippians 2.5 says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Friends, this morning, I pray that as we take communion, as we remember again the incredible sacrifice and gift of Jesus Christ, that as you take that little piece of bread that represents his body, the juice that represents his blood, shed on our behalf, that you would consider in your own life, am I an example of that kind of servanthood? Am I an example of that kind of selflessness? Let's pray. God, as we come before you this morning in thankfulness, in appreciation for giving us a fresh start, giving us the opportunity to even set an example of you, God, we thank you for your gift. We thank you for your life. And that, Father, you have called us sons and daughters of the King. Amen.